everybody. I am Dr. Avish Patel, consultant spine surgeon from Sunshine Global Hospital, Vadodara. First of all, I would like to thank ASSI and Dr. Gautam Zaveri for giving me this opportunity to share my experience in Video Journal Club. Today, I will be talking about research on spine metastasis that influence my practice. When we see patients of spine metastasis in our practice, there's always this clinical dilemma whether this patient should undergo surgery or should require a chemo or a radiotherapy. If we look into the history of spine metastasis treatment, in the early part of the 20th century, spine laminectomy was the treatment of choice for patient of metastatic spinal cord compression. With the advent of radiotherapy in the late 1950s, results of laminectomy plus radiation did not seem to differ from result with radiation alone. Hence, surgery was largely abandoned. Later on, in the 1980s, better surgical techniques such as circumferential decompression, anterior approach surgery, and spinal stabilization were introduced. With this improvement, many uncontrolled series and a meta-analysis at the time showed that the result of surgery and radiation are better than radiation alone. So there was a need to revisit and re-evaluate the efficacy of surgery plus post-operative radiation in a randomized controlled trial. And this Herculean task was accomplished by a landmark paper published in Lancet in 2005 by Roy Petchel and colleagues. This randomized multicentric non-blinded trial was conducted mainly at University of Kentucky and six other institutions in US over a period of 10 years. In this study, patients with MRI evidence of metastatic epidural spinal cord compression, presence of neurological signs or symptoms, but not complete paraplegia of more than 48 hours were included. Patients with radiosensitive tumors such as lymphoma, leukemia, and multiple myeloma were excluded, and patients with recurrent compression, previous radiation, or spinal cord compression due to other causes were excluded. So 123 patients were enrolled over a period of 10 years, and out of which 101 patients were randomly assigned into either surgery followed by radiotherapy with 50 patients, or radiotherapy alone group with 51 patients. Now, before randomization, patients were stratified according to institution, tumor type, ambulatory status, and relative stability of spine. Direct circumferential decompression was performed in all patients that underwent surgery, and surgical stabilization was considered in unstable metastasis according to Cybulski criteria of 1989. Radiotherapy was started 14 days after the surgery, and the total dose of radiation in both the groups was 30 gray, which was divided in 10 sessions. The primary endpoint of the study was ability to ambulate, whereas secondary endpoints were urinary continence, changes in functional status, utilizing Frankel functional score, Asia motor score, use of corticosteroids and opioids, and survival duration. Due to stratification at institutional level, the patient characteristics in both groups were identical. If we look at the primary endpoint, there was a statistically significant difference between the two groups. The patient in the surgical group, they had better post-treatment ambulation rate. They were able to remain ambulatory for a longer period of time. They had better ability to retain ambulation and they had a better ability to regain ambulation. Now, initial plan of the study was to in, uh, enroll 100 patients in both the groups. But after this interim analysis, the Data Safety and Monitoring, Monitoring Committee deemed that the trial should be stopped because of proven superiority of surgical treatment. Even if we look at the secondary endpoints, there was better maintenance of continence or Asia and Frankel score in surgical group marginally increased survival duration in surgical group and significantly less corticosteroid and opioid group opioid in surgical group was noted out of 51 patients that underwent radiotherapy there were about 10 patients that showed worsening 
and they had to undergo surgery. But it is important to see that uh, out of these 10 patients, seven remain uh, non-ambulatory uh, for the rest of their life. And there were about 40 complications related to infections and wound diseases. So it is clear from the outcome that patients who underwent direct decompressive surgery with or without stabilization and followed by radiotherapy, they retain their ability to walk longer. They're more likely to regain ambulation. They have marginally longer survival and there is significant reduced need of corticosteroid and opioids. Now a possible limitation to this trial was patient selection bias because of the extensive and the exclusive criteria uh, the results of this study can only be applied to patients who met the specific criteria that are outlined in this study. And second, there was no standardized surgical treatment of fixation device used in this study. But even with this limitation, the study established that the best treatment for spinal cord compression caused by metastatic cancer is surgery as initial treatment followed by radiotherapy. Now, in the 21st century, uh, the treatment of epidural spinal cord compression and worsening neurodeficit was well defined. But the concept of instability was not reliably communicated within the surgeons and oncophysicians. Saibulski and colleagues, they made an attempt to assess instability in metastatic disease based on the three column spine model. But the model which is derived from trauma may not be applicable to uh, neoplastic conditions because both these conditions, they have a different set of ligamentous involvement, bony destructions, different potential of healing. And therefore, spine instability assessment requires a specific and a different set of criteria. Because of the inconsistencies in recognizing instability in neoplastic conditions, there were a lot of inappropriate or missed referrals and there was a communication gap between the surgeons and oncophysicians. As a result, a lot of potentially unstable spine patients, they develop, they used to develop skeletal related events such as pathological fractures, and this would cause a significant negative impact on the quality of life and daily functioning of the patients. As a result, spine oncology study group an uh, internationally recognized group of 30 experts developed a classification based on literature review and expert consensus. The spine oncology study group defines spine instability as loss of spine integrity as a result of a neoplastic process that is associated with movement-related pain, symptomatic or progressive deformity, and or neural compromise under physiological loads. A modified Delphi method was used to integrate the available evidence with expert opinion and a classification system was derived that comprised of six components, one clinical and five radiological component. The only co clinical component was mechanical pain, which if present was given a score of three, any other pain was given a score of one and pain free, free lesions were scored zero. Junctional lesions, they receive, they were considered unstable and that's why a score of 3 was assigned. Whereas lesion in mobile spine were scored 2. Semi-rigid uh, lesions located in the thoracic spine were scored 1. And the sacral lesions were scored 0. If you look at the spinal alignment, uh, which was uh, basically evaluated on a serial radiograph or by comparing supine and upright radiograph, so subluxation and translations uh, receive a score of four. Adenovo deformity in form of kyphosis or uh, scoliosis received a score of two. And the normal alignment is, has a score of zero. Now, lytic lesions were considered uh, unstable. So they receive a score of two. Whereas blastic lesions, which were considered stable, received a score of zero. If you look at the vertebral body collapse, more than 50% collapse is a significant indicator of instability. So the score of three was assigned to more than 50% collapse. 
less than 50% collapse, the score of two. No collapse, but more than 50% involved, a score of one was assigned. And uh, less than 50% of involvement of vertebral body, the score of zero was assigned. Posterior elements were also considered important. And uh, by posterior elements, they mean uh, they have included pedicles, facet, and or posterior transverse joint. So if there is a bilateral involvement, the score uh, is three. And in case of unilateral involvement, the score is one. So when all these six components are combined, a total skin sin score is obtained. And if the total score is between zero to six, uh, it is considered a stable. If the score is between seven to 12, it is considered potentially unstable. And 13 and above is considered highly unstable. So let's uh, look at this case example. So this 77 year male who was having unknown primary came up with a severe back pain and this D12 pathological fracture. So if we assess the scene score for D12 fracture, the pain is three because it was mechanical in nature. The location again is at the dorsal lumbar junction is three. The alignment, there is no translation, subluxation, or kyphosis, scoliosis. So the alignment is zero. It is a lytic lesion, which led to subsequent collapse of the vertebral body. So it is two. Body collapse is present more than 50%. So it is three. And there is involvement of bilateral pedicle and facet. So posterior involvement, again, score is three. So this gives a total score of 14. And hence, the spine is considered highly unstable. And this would require some form of stabilization. Now, since uh, the SIN score is obtained from an expert consensus, it needs to be validated. And also the clinical impact of the SIN score needs to be evaluated. So Mutuza and colleagues, they have observed that there is a good intra-observer and inter-observer reliability with uh, between uh, multiple specialists, be it radiation oncologists, spine surgeons or a medical oncologist. Van der Welden prospectively evaluated the relationship between mechanical stability and response to palliative radiotherapy. And they observed that a lower SINCE score was associated with a complete response to radiotherapy, whereas patients with SINCE score of seven to higher, they continue to have pain even after palliative radiotherapy and they recommend a surgical reference to patients having SIN score of seven or higher. Hussein uh, prospectively evaluated uh, patient reported outcomes and they have observed that there is a significant positive correlation between increasing SIN score and severity of preoperative pain. And they have also noted that after surgical stabilization of this patient, their pain significantly reduces and thereby they indirectly validate the SIN score with that of a mechanical instability. Burst, Burstag and colleagues, they have observed the impact of SIN score in clinical practice and they observed it after the introduction of SIN score. Patients were referred earlier and there is an increased awareness of instability among the multidisciplinary team involving medical and radiation oncologist. This recently published systematic review showed that SIN score is very accurate in predicting post radiotherapy vertebral compression fractures and thereby may be an indirect evaluation of accuracy of SIN score. We are still awaiting prospective validation of SIN score and the among the other limitations, one should always consider SIN score as a one of the component of evaluation process. There are many other components, be it neurological assessment, general condition of the patient, and all this needs to be considered before considering any form of treatment in such patients. There are many factors which are not accounted in SIN score. These are multi-level disease, previous surgery, poor bone quality, impact of body weight and activity level on instability. In spite of these limitations, spine instability neoplastic score is a key component for treatment 
decision making in spine oncology it has filled a void and it serves as a standard reference to evaluate the degree of spinal instability and it helps radiation and medical oncologists to know when to refer a patient for a spinal intervention now moving forward during last 15 20 years there is a tremendous pro progress in the field of radiology and spine surgery and hence this is an era of advancement if we look at the advances in radiology there is an introduction of image guided radiotherapy and stereotactic body radiotherapy which provides uh, and with the help of which a very high dose of radiation can be delivered to a very small re small segment and the amount of scatter can be reduced so because of this very high dose of radiation can be given to tumors in precise location without causing radiation damage to spinal cord and with that even radio resistant tumors can be controlled locally for a longer period of time so now the question is what is what are the clinical implications or what are the implications as a spine surgeon because of this advances so the n block resection which was previously required for many oligometastatic disease has come down because of this advances and nowadays n block resections are only indicated for oligometastatic disease that have an excellent survival whereas other kind of oligometastatic disease where we have a radio resistant primary with a good to fair survival separation surgeries are becoming popular so the reduction in end block resections have led to a reduction in the complication rate of end block resections and separation surgery being a less aggressive surgery than an end block resection they have better outcomes so for example in this patient having a uh, epidural spread of a tumor a uh, separation surgery was conducted a posterior decompression pediculectomy facetectomy and partial corpectomy was done and now the remaining part of the tumor is subjected to a stereotactic body radiation so a review published in 2016 showed that with separation surgery followed by sbrt good to excellent local control has been obtained even in cases of radio resistant tumors and because of all this advances when we look together uh, we feel that there is a need to have an holistic approach involving spine surgeon medical oncologist and radiation oncologist for treatment of metastatic tumors and this multidisciplinary approach was published in 2013 by lofer and colleagues which is known as the norms framework so norms framework basically has four components n stands for neurological o for oncological m mechanical and s systematic this norms framework was developed over a period of 15 years by multidisciplinary spine team at memorial sloan kettering cancer center so this table outlines the norms decision framework so let's look at the first component that is neurological which has two parts one is the assessment clinical assessment which we won't go into the detail and the second is epidural spinal cord compression scale so metastatic epidural spinal cord compression scale was used for assessment of epidural compression and this was a six point system developed by similar authors and published in 2010 for the sake of simplicity uh one can conclude that when in absence of spinal cord indentation by tumor the preferred treatment of choice is radiotherapy the only exception to this rule is instability and when there is a spinal cord indentation compression the preferred treatment is surgery and the only exception to this rule is highly radiosensitive tumors now moving forward looking at the oncological section so uh, the radio sensitivity of tumor is being given prime importance in this uh, norms framework and uh, 
Hence, if we look at tumors like lymphoma, seminoma, and myeloma, which are highly radiosensitive, the treatment of choice would be radiotherapy in form of conventional external beam radiation. And uh, only exception to this will be an unstable spine or unstable metastasis. On the other hand, uh, radiosensitive tumors such as breast and prostate, which are sensitive but not highly sensitive, needs to be managed based on their epidural score and uh, instability. And uh, can most of these patients, they can undergo a conventional radiotherapy. But in cases of radioresistant tumors, such as sarcoma, melanoma, GI tumors, and renal cell carcinoma, all these tumors, they are highly radioresistant. And hence, it is very important to know what kind of radiotherapy these patients need to undergo. And if at all a surgical intervention is required, they need to undergo a separation surgery so that in order to provide a margin, a free margin for a tumor-free interval between the bulk of the tumor in the vertebral body and the dural sac. So now coming to the third component, which is the mechanical component. Here the aim is to identify unstable spine. So SIN score is used for evaluation of mechanical instability. If the SIN score is less than seven, uh, there is no need for stabilization. And for if the SIN score is more than seven, uh, stabilization should be considered in cases where surgical intervention is, is deemed necessary. And the authors also believe that when there is a compression fracture without instability, the cement augmentation would suffice. Now coming to the last component, which is a systemic component, which actually involves assessment of four subcomponents. That is, the first one is the survival estimate. We need to have a survival estimate before considering the aggressiveness of the intervention and before considering any kind of surgical intervention. Second, there are certain tumor uh, histological subtypes of tumor that may give a poor prognostic factor. For example, triple negative receptor status in breast or a non adenocarcinoma pathology in case of a lung cancer. So this needs to, one needs to be aware of this poor prognostic factors and an aggressive surgery should be avoided in such patients. The third is the medical fitness and the medical comorbidities. Usually the Karnofsky performance status score and the ECOG score are used for evaluation of uh, medical fitness in case of uh, spinal in, uh, spine metastatic spine tumors. And the fourth component is the extent of tumor dissemination where a presence of unresectable visceral mats and brain mats, they, can, they give a poor prognostic prognosis to the patient. So basically, the aim of this systemic assessment is to know that before any intervention, surgical intervention, patient should at least have a survival of more than three months. And second, aggressive interventions should only be done in medically fit patient with an excellent survival prognosis. Now, NOMS framework has not been clinically validated, but considering the fact that it is based on logical understanding of behavior of spine metastasis, and it is derived from years of experience with patients of spine metastasis, the components do help in guiding decision-making in clinical practice. Also, there are certain limitations, such as the role of chemotherapy, especially in case of lymphoma, has not been highlighted and uh, that should also be taken into consideration. Not all patients with radioresistant tumor can undergo SBRT and uh, one should always inquire with the radiologist as to what kind of post-operative radiotherapy the patient is uh, about to undergo before considering surgical intervention. Poor prognostic factors such as failed previous radiation or surgery is not incorporated. Patient wishes and expectations are also not incorporated in this norms framework. And uh, many times we see patients, they come to us very late with a neurological deficit. 
and at that time it is we don't have any histological diagnosis and because of the deficit we may not have sufficient time to wait for the histological uh, histological results so management of such patient has not been highlighted in uh, in norms framework and last is the location of tumor may have an influence on treatment decision and that also needs to be taken into consideration several other treatment algorithms uh, that have tried to overcome the deficiencies of the norms framework but i believe that the norms framework provides a treatment framework that is easily adaptable to surgical radiation and medical treatment option and the four parameters of norms are easily recalled consider the, they consider the overall condition of the patient and they allow for a seamless integration of treatment advances into decision making process so let me share some case examples so this this is what this is a 44 year old female having a breast carcinoma which has metastasized to uh, c3 and c6 if we do norms assessment uh, this patient had myelopathy so the neurologically she was having asia d the epidural spinal cord compression was grade 2 oncology breast carcinoma is usually radio sensitive there was no instability the sin score for c3 was 6 and the sin score for c6 was 5 and on systemic assessment there were no visual mats and there was favorable uh, histopathological subtype so uh, we this patient underwent just a laminectomy followed by a post operative radiotherapy or a and a chemotherapy another case 77 year male patient having severe mechanical back pain and neurological deficit when this patient came to us we did not have any histological diagnosis so if we do the norms assessment the neurology is asia c the epidural spinal cord compression is grade 3 oncology we didn't knew at that time mechanical component uh, shows the scene scrolling as we have already done it it is 14 and the systemic components were favorable and so we decided to do a decompression and stabilization along with partial coprectomy and it turned out to be a multiple myeloma which was which responded well to chemo and radiotherapy last case 82 year old female having minimal back pain and biopsy proven diagnosis of non hodgkin's lymphoma was made and if you do the norms assessment she had normal neurology lymphoma are usually radio and chemo sensitive she had potentially unstable spine at l1 uh, the sin score was 10 but we decided to keep her under close observation and subject her to chemo and radiotherapy because of the systemic features and she responded well to chemo and radiotherapy so with this i would like to conclude that the norms framework provide a holistic treatment algorithm for the treatment of metastatic spinal tumors thank you